so um, the mic is working. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here, and I'm glad to be here. Um, we're going to start talking about some pretty simple ideas of what is the what is our atmosphere? What is uh, what do we mean when we say air? What are we talking about? And then we'll gradually build up, and I want to give you by the end of the period a little bit of idea of what kind of research we do um, studying the atmosphere, the physics of the atmosphere. So let's see, where will we start? I'm going to be guided by this over here. Of course, there's the Earth, and um, it's uh, covered with a layer of air. And in the atmosphere, in that layer of air, there are some clouds. And of course, that's what you're seeing, a mixture of clear air and clouds. And we'll be getting closer to that by the end of the period, looking at clear air and clouds. Well, let me start with this. So I'm going to be asking you kids a few questions this morning. And I need to hear those answers loud and clear. So let's just do a practice run on that. If I say, is something true and it is true, you're going to say yes and you're going to raise your hand together. Shout it out and raise your hand. One, two, three, yes. yes. There you go. OK, I want to hear that loud and clear because some of the times you're going to be right and some of the times maybe you're going to be wrong. Let's start with this one. So what is the air? What is the atmosphere? Now, first choice you have is that those two words, air and atmosphere, describe the nothingness around us. Um, I don't see the air. I see you guys out there. I don't see the air. Uh, I don't smell anything. I don't feel anything. So it may be there's just nothing there. And that's one option. The other option is that those words, air and atmosphere, describe some kind of a gas, whatever that word means, gas, held to the Earth by the Earth's gravity. Now, how many believe in number one? Yes. OK, we got a few. And how many believe in number two? Yes. OK, number two has it. But you know, I think number two is right. I think you guys are right. But You've got some explaining to do. Because why is it that I don't see anything, and I don't smell anything, and I don't feel anything? So we're going to work on that. But maybe you guys are right, but I'm not sure about that. We'll see as we go along. Now, how do we know an atmosphere is present? Now, I noticed when I came in, you guys were already doing some nice experiments uh, that would give you the answer to these questions. But I'm going to uh, uh, do a few other really simple experiments up here. And um, the first one would just be trying to see how fast a piece of paper would drop. Now, if there were no atmosphere in this room, that would drop like a rock. And you'd hear it go bang when it hits the floor. But in fact, it goes down pretty slowly. That's an indication that there's something here. And whatever that thing is, it's got some mass. It's preventing that air from just, uh, that paper from just dropping. Um, now, a paper airplane, if uh, there's no air in this room, obviously it's not going to fly. Let's see if it does. Yeah, it works pretty well. So there must be something here. It can't be nothing. That, that, something's holding up that airplane. Um, well, when the, it's really windy outside, it was a couple days ago, you feel that wind hitting you. It actually pushes you around. So something with mass is hitting you and pushing you around. I mean, I can demonstrate it here a little bit. And I noticed out in the hall there, you had this wonderful little air gun. Did everybody get to try that? Who tried that air gun out there? Wasn't that cool? So it made a little jet of air that knocked over some cups. And that was a real nice proof that there's something here that's moving around and it has mass. Now, uh, well, obviously number four, you know, if there wasn't any air in this room, you wouldn't be able to hear me talking and I wouldn't be able to hear you. So 
when I do this and you can hear it, that means that sound is propagating through the air. Sound cannot propagate in a vacuum. If there's nothing there, that sound can't reach you. So you know there's air for that reason. Um, well, this would be the time to take a casual little drink of water. But I've got a straw that I'm drinking the water through. And that's good. But what's going on? Would that work? Would I be able to drink through a straw if there were no atmosphere? Uh, what's the answer? Yes or no? No. no, because what's happening is that the air pressure is getting down into that bottle, pressing down on the surface of the water, and then that's what's pushing it up the straw. All I'm doing is reducing the pressure a little bit. There's still pressure at the top. I'm just reducing it a little bit to allow that atmospheric pressure to push the water up the tube. So when you see me here casually drinking, that too is proof that there's something in this room that has weight and it has pressure. So I'm trying to overwhelm you with evidence because I don't see anything. So we need to prove that there's something here. Um, OK, I noticed outside there were some suction cups. I need a couple of volunteers. Uh, could two of you guys come forward and just try to pull these apart for me? Come right on up. Stand here and watch out because you know if they let go, you're going to fall maybe, but each take one of those. Now remember, let me just take this a second. These aren't sticky. There's no glue in there. Uh, so the only thing that's going to hold them apart is the fact that I'm removing the air from inside, but you've still got the air pressure pushing on the outside. It's the same air pressure that I was using to drink this. So let's see. Let's get these lined up a little better. Now just Pull those apart for me. <laughs> now, those are either really weak kids, and I don't think that's the case, or, um, or there's a lot of air pressure in the room. OK, you guys have done well. <laughs> that's excellent. Thanks very much. You guys are terrific. Um, so I think we're closing in on this. Maybe I almost had you convinced that there's something in this room. And if you still don't believe it, when you go outside this morning and look up, get outside that door on the way out, you're going to see some clouds and maybe some blue sky. And that blue, of course, is sunlight being scattered to your eye by the air molecules. If there was no atmosphere and you looked up, it would just be black. Now, if you ever climb to the top of a very high mountain like Mount Everest and you look up, you're already above most of the atmosphere, not much air above you. And so when you look up, you don't see blue, you just see black. So that blue sky is also telling you that there's atmosphere up there. OK, I think we've got that one surrounded. Also, by the way, when you are up in a satellite and you look down at Earth, you see this little fuzzy blue layer there. It's not very thick compared to the radius of the Earth, but that's the atmosphere. That's the Earth's atmosphere. So that's some additional evidence. Now, here's a question for you guys. Um, what would happen? I've already, well, you've already told me, and I think you were correct, that the atmosphere is a gas held to our planet by the gravity field of our planet. Just like you and I are held down by the gravity of the planet. Well, what would happen? Now, this is just a thought experiment. This wouldn't, couldn't really happen in practice. But what would happen if we suddenly turned off gravity? I'm going to give you two options here. You tell me which one you think is right. I suddenly turn off Earth gravity. Our bodies would suddenly shoot up off the planet, or the atmosphere would explode upwards, leaving us just sitting behind. OK, you got those two options? How many think that it's number one? Let me hear you. OK, how many think it's number two? 
That's about an even split. Well, here's what I think would happen. I think it'd be number two, because the atmosphere is held down by the gravity field, kind of like the air in your tire is held in by the rubber of the tire. And if I were to puncture that tire, that air gas would explode outwards. If I were to puncture that balloon, you'd get an explosion out. Whatever is holding that, if I suddenly remove it, it will explode upwards. Whereas we, we're massive. Um, we're not a, a gas, a compressible gas. So we would just be standing there on Earth, and boom, the atmosphere would be gone, and we'd be looking around saying, what in the world just happened? So it's number two is the right answer. Now, I have to follow that question with this one, which is kind of a natural extension of that last question. So the atmosphere would be gone in an instant. And I think you know that we depend on our atmosphere to keep us alive in many different ways. The atmosphere is our friend. But the way I'm posing the question here is not would the lack of an atmosphere kill us? The answer to that is yes. But what would kill us first? What aspect of missing the atmosphere would kill us first? Number one, we would be hit by cosmic rays and ultraviolet radiation that is normally uh, stopped by the atmosphere so they don't hit us. That's a very important role for the atmosphere. Also, there are a lot of small little meteorites in space moving at an enormous rate of speed. When they come into the atmosphere, they burn up before they hit us, and we are protected by the atmosphere uh, from those little meteorites. Um, number three, without this atmospheric pressure we've been demonstrating, our blood would boil. You know that when you go to high altitude, when you, if you boil water at sea level, it's 212 Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. If you go up to the top of Pikes Peak, in Colorado and boil water, it boils at a considerably lower temperature. And if you were to go up to Mount Everest, it would boil at even a lower temperature. Uh, the lower the pressure, the lower is the boiling temperature of water. Well, if I removed the air pressure completely, that might change the boiling temperature and put it down in the range of what my body temperature Normally, That's what I mean by number three. And number four would be we would suffocate because every, every minute or so, every half minute, I'm taking in a breath, putting it out, using the oxygen uh, to keep my circulatory system going, my, my metabolism going. So we depend on the atmosphere for all those things. They would all do us in if we didn't have it, but which one would come first? So how many think it would be number one? A few. Yeah. Shout it out loud. Get your hand up. OK. How many think it would be number two? Yeah. Somebody yeah. in the back. Good for you. How about number three? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Quite a few answers on that. What about number four? Yeah. yeah. OK. Number four has the majority. But number three is the right answer. Yeah. Our blood would boil instantly, and we would die, I have to say, a very excruciating death. Something like. Uh, if, you've, if you know any scuba divers, ask them about something called the bandmiss. If you've been down diving and your blood gets saturated with gas and then you suddenly pop to the surface, your blood boils and you die a very agonizing death. Sorry to bring that into your Saturday morning. Don't worry. <laughs> it's not going to happen. That's the last thing you have to worry about. OK, see, we're beginning to understand something about the atmosphere. That's good. Now, I want to turn to this question of balloons, because I want to talk to you about how weather balloons are used to study the atmosphere. And I can't do that if you don't understand why weather balloon uh, goes up in the atmosphere. These are helium-filled balloons. And they definitely want to go up. I've got them tied to a string. I had an adventure coming over here. I filled up a big red helium balloon. and. Um, I tried it once, and I lost it up in the sky. 
I tried it again and I made it right to that door and it popped as I came in the door. And Kurt was kind enough to blow these up for me. So at least I have some kind of a helium balloon to show you. But I want to do an experiment. <coughs> well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get some answers on this first and then I'll do the experiment. So um, the helium filled uh, balloon does tend to rise. You see it there. Is it because gravity does not act on that balloon? Or is it because there's some kind of invisible string up here pulling it upwards that I can't see? Or is it because the balloon filled with helium has something called a buoyancy force acting on it? OK, those are your three options. How many think it's number one? Number two? Yes. OK, a couple <laughs> for number two. Thank you. Now, that string may be there, but. I don't find it. And how about number three? Yeah. There you go. I guess that one was too easy. But what, OK, you, you, like, that, you like that explanation because it sounds more technical, right? It's got a term in there, buoyancy force. And you don't know what that means. They figure, well, I'll go with that one because that's a, that's a technical, a technical sounding answer. But um, what is this thing called a buoyancy force? Well. I'm going to describe it a couple times, and then we're going to do an experiment to see if it's really true. So a buoyancy force, you know, as you go up in the atmosphere, I already mentioned this, as you go up in the atmosphere, the air pressure gets less and less and less. Eventually, you get outside the atmosphere, and there's no air pressure at all. Now, if the air pressure decreases as you go up in the atmosphere, that means that at the bottom of those balloons, the air pressure is a little bit greater than at the top of those balloons. So the air pressure pushing up here is a little bit greater than the air pushing down there. Now that may surprise you that that makes any difference, because that's not a very great distance, is it? That's only 10 or 20 centimeters. But that actually is the origin of the buoyancy force. That really is why those balloons are trying to rise is because the air pressure there is a little bit greater than the air pressure there. Now, um, I've got a demonstration to do. Let me just see what's on this next one here. Yeah, so uh, taking into account what I've just told you, uh, does the balloon have a greater mass or weight when I blow it up? I'm going to do this experiment for you. I'm going to weigh a balloon, then I'm going to blow it up with air. We're going to weigh it again. And we're going to see if um, it weighs anything different. So before I do it, let me just get some answers on this one. Kurt is being technical here. Um, number one, no, when I blow up a balloon with air, it does not change its weight. Number two, when I blow up a balloon with air, it weighs more. Or number three, yes, again, when I will blow up the balloon with air, its mass and weight changes. But this change is exactly canceled by the buoyancy force. So let's, this is a more technical one, maybe more difficult. Let's get some answers. How many think, number one, when I blow up the balloon with air, it does not change its weight? Yeah. OK, a lot of good answers there. Number two, when I blow up the balloon, it weighs more. Yeah. Yes. We got some answers there. And what about yes? Also yes, when I blow up the balloon with air, it does increase its mass and its weight, but that is canceled by the buoyancy force. Yes. Yes. Quite a few like that one, but there was a hesitation. I could see you thinking there. Well, now, I've got an experiment, and I hope this works. I have a balloon, and um, I'm going to weigh the balloon. I've got this box up here. <coughs> What's that? Scale on the no, the scale. Oh, to see the numbers. I'm not sure that's going to work because I know it's like I've got to set the balloon on there later on. It's not going to work. I've got. I'll have to read the number off for you. But let me just put this up so I can write on the board. Okay. 
Okay, so I've set, the, you've all used a scale before. I've set this to zero with the box on there. Um, so I'm going to weigh the balloon. And it weighs um, 33 grams. Has a mass of 33 grams. And um, now I'm going to try, oh, I better be careful here. I have to tie this string off, and I want to be a good scientist and do things carefully, so I better weigh the string that I'm going to use, too. Hold on here. Ooh, see, that made a difference, so I'm going to say 36 grams with the string. Now I'm going to blow this balloon up, I hope. Kurt, if I faint away doing this, you can finish the demonstration. It's a big balloon, right? So it's going to take me a couple of minutes to do this, so you guys can just doze off. ways to go. Uh, by the way, I know that if I blow this up to about that size, I will have put about 60 grams, about 60 grams of air in there, if I can get it blown up to a good size. It's shutting off on me here. It's going to take a while. <laughs> the room keeps collapsing on me. Almost there. I want to get it bigger though for you. Okay, that should do it. But I've got to tie this off. Can you help me just tie that off for a second with the string I've got there? Just tie it there. Not again. So I've put in about 60 grams of air in there. And I'm going to weigh this again. That is reading 36.5. And yet, I have put in approximately 60 grams of air. Well, that's very curious. Um, I know that if I add other things to the box, I can add the weight. But yet, when I put air in this balloon, a lot of air in that balloon, it doesn't seem to have changed the weight of that at all. So, well, the answer is number three. I added mass by putting the air in there, but now I've made the balloon bigger so the pressure difference between the bottom and the top is now bigger. So there's a buoyancy force on that balloon that was not there before. And that's why I'm getting no change in weight. So that's the idea behind the buoyancy force. The bigger the object is, the bigger the balloon is, the more buoyancy force is. And if I fill it with air, 
there's always going to be exactly that cancellation. However mass, how much mass I put in there, the buoyancy force is going to exactly cancel it. But when I fill it with helium, because helium is a lighter gas, I get an increase in buoyancy force that's greater than the mass that I put inside the balloon. And that's why there's a net buoyancy force on that balloon to make it go up and up. So that's the idea there. I think that's clear now. So there's the idea behind the buoyancy force. The air pressure decreases with height, so there's a greater pressure on the bottom than the top. The difference is called the buoyancy force, and the bigger the balloon, the bigger is the buoyancy force. And if I fill it with air, those two things cancel. The weight of the balloon, of the air that I put in, and the buoyancy force is exactly cancel. Okay, we're ready to move on now. Oh, by the way, this buoyancy force, you have experienced this yourself, because when you're swimming, you're being held up by the water, and it's exactly the buoyancy force. The pressure on your belly is a little bit greater than the pressure on your back in the water, and that's what keeps you floating in the water. And so you've experienced that in water, but now you understand that this happens in air as well, because like water, air has mass and air has weight. So it puts a buoyancy force on any object that is um, in it. Now we're ready to talk about weather balloons. As a meteorologist, I get a lot of my information about the atmosphere from weather balloons. And uh, here's a few facts. Hundreds of weather balloons are launched each day from stations around the world. As they rise up through the atmosphere, um, they're carrying a little instrument package. Here's one that I brought along. It measures temperature, humidity. It's got a radio antenna, so it can radio that information back. And by seeing how it drifts with the wind, we can measure the wind speed and direction as a function of height. Uh, so it's just a helium balloon with that little instrument package under it. And we get information about wind, temperature, and humidity. That information is used to understand the atmosphere and predict the weather. By the way, uh, like I say, there are hundreds of these launched every day. They take about two hours to go up to about 20 miles. Then the balloon breaks, and they fall back to Earth. And they're never found and never reused. And occasionally, somebody will find one. And there is a little note on here. It says, please return to the Weather Bureau if you find this. Very few people ever do. But has anybody here ever seen one of these things? Ever found one? No. It's a bit surprising because there's so many have been launched over so many years. And yet, I've only come across one or two in my lifetime. And uh, just by accident. Of course, most of them fall in the ocean. Um, OK. So that's what it looks like. Helium balloon, bigger than the ones we have here. Um, there's the instrument package. She's holding it there. There's a little parachute, so it, when it falls back to Earth, it doesn't fall fast enough that it would hurt anybody when it, um, when it comes back to the Earth's surface. And these are the stations where weather balloons are launched twice a day, uh, every day for the last 50 years, uh, weather services around the, around the world in all those different countries have been launching their weather balloons. And that data, by the way, goes into your daily weather forecast. That's how we forecast things. That's how we forecast the weather. Now, what kind of data do we get from that? Um, this morning. I went online to get the data from the balloon soundings that were la launched yesterday evening. The launch was at, uh, yeah, we're in Eastern Standard Time, the launch was at 7 p.m. last night. And this is some data from um, the closest balloon launching station to us. It's just across Long Island Sound on Long Island. It's a little town called Upton. And what's plotted here is temperature on this axis 
altitude or pressure decreasing as you go up. This black line is temperature. This black line is dew point. Dew point tells you something about how much water vapor there is in the atmosphere. And then over here on the right hand side is the wind information uh, presented to you with a little uh, thing a meteorologist calls a wind barb. It's a little diagram you draw, a little symbol that you draw. The direction tells you the wind is what, what direction the wind is blowing in, and the number of feathers tells you how fast the wind is blowing. For example, that's a 20 knot wind, 15 knot wind. A, a 50 knot wind is a thick one, so 65, 70, 70, 65. Those, are, those units are in knots. Um, they'd be slightly greater in miles per hour, for example. Um, a 70 knot wind is about an 85 mile per hour wind. That's a pretty good wind. Now that's way up above the Earth's atmosphere, above the Earth's surface. That's probably three or four miles up in the atmosphere. And then I went to another station down in northern Florida. I went to the Tallahassee station. Has anybody been to Florida, been to Tallahassee? Anybody? You know where it is, right? It's in northern Florida. And um, there's the sounding launched at the same time, but from a different city. Temperature, altitude. But well, let's just look over here at that wind. My goodness. We've got 150 knots. We've got 160 knots. That's about 180 miles per hour up there. 180 miles per hour that wind is moving. Now, one of the things, because all those, because all the balloons are launched simultaneously, they rise together around the world. You can make a map, an instantaneous map of the winds at any altitude that you want. And here's what it looks like for that moment last night. Let me tell you where you are. Here's Florida. Here's New Haven, Connecticut. There's the Upton uh, data that I gave you. And there's the Tallahassee data that I gave you. Now this color coding is described down here in knots. And look at that. There's a jet stream coming across the northern part of our country, swinging southward, and then accelerating again, getting up to speeds in excess of 150 knots, blowing west to east. Like I said, that's a speed of about 180 miles an hour. It's fast, fast wind. And this is what weather balloons can do for you. They can tell you what the winds at all altitudes are, are like. And by the way, if you fly on a commercial airliner, uh, American Airlines, Delta, this is about the altitude that they fly at. So I bet the pilots are looking at that map and saying, well, if I'm going west to east, I'm going to get my airplane right into that jet and get a free ride. But if I'm going east to west, I better take a different route. I better come like this or I better come like this because I'm not going to want to go uh, right against that 180 mile an hour wind coming right in my face. I'll burn up a lot more fuel. It'll add an hour or two to my flight. And so the pilots take a very close look at this and they get their data the same way I have here. They get it from the, from the weather balloons, the daily, the daily weather balloons. OK, now we're getting on in time, so i got to wrap up. At the, um, the last thing I want to talk about is research aircraft, because this is another way that we understand and do research on the atmosphere. Remember, all the weather balloon does is um, temperature, humidity, and wind. Well, there's a lot of other things we'd like to know about the atmosphere, uh, but we can't get the instruments for that to go on a on a device like this and just be thrown away. Instead, we put them on a research aircraft. Here's a research aircraft that I've used recently in one of my projects. It looks a bit like a normal airplane, except if you look closely, it's got a nose boom with some instruments out there. And then it's got some instruments under the wing as well. And inside, it's loaded with computers and scientists. So this is what we use to do atmospheric research. Now, I have to remember, since I've told you about the weather balloon, what holds the airplane up? It's not buoyancy, but it's something related to buoyancy. 
because the air has to go rapidly over the wing of the airplane, you get high pressure below and low pressure above. In this case, because the airplane is moving so rapidly, and that produces something called lift uh, that keeps it up. It's a little bit different than buoyancy, because buoyancy, you don't have to be moving through the air. There you do, so we call it lift instead of buoyancy. But that pressure difference helps to keep the airplane up in the atmosphere. Now, what about these instruments that scientists use? Here's uh, uh, one of the wingtips of this aircraft. This is the King Air aircraft. And there's some devices under here that measure a variety of things, but especially they measure particles in the atmosphere. Dust particles, we call those aerosols, or cloud particles, or even raindrops. If you happen to fly through a rain shaft, it'll measure the raindrops as well. Here's a list of some of those instruments. Remember, these three can be done on balloons, but not the rest of these. And also on the aircraft, we have some remote sensing devices. We've got radar that can send a microwave signal out and get the echo coming back telling us about raindrops. We've got LIDAR, basically a laser that goes out and scatters back, giving us information about dust in the atmosphere. So um, on one of our flights in this recent project, there was our little crew. It's a pretty small airplane. You've got the pilot. You've got the data guy. You've got the chief scientist. And you've got, uh, that's my student, Allison, who was sitting in the front on this particular day. There she is, um, taking notes. She's got uh, a data screens in front of her. You can't see it, where all the data is coming out on a computer screen. I'm sitting in the back. I've got one of those computer screens, too. And the pilot is, can't see, but he's on the left there. So uh, looking out the front window, that's what you see. There's the nose boom. And uh, we're seeing some clouds up ahead. We're going to fly through those clouds. Uh, there's another student on a different flight looking happy in the back seat and taking some pictures out the window. And there's the data that's coming out on his little computer screen here. And um, that's looking out the left window. That's what he's seeing as he takes that photograph. He's seeing some of the instruments on that wingtip. And he's also seeing some big clouds that were flying by that were going to penetrate. Uh, and there's a view out the right window. Again, there's an island, there's the ocean, there's some clouds, and there's some uh, more uh, instruments under the right wingtip there. Um, now, we're just about to penetrate that cloud. And what did we find when we penetrated that cloud? Well, this is the kind of data that we we gather on these research missions. So let me explain what's plotted here. You know, when clouds form, the droplets are very tiny. They're not large enough to fall to Earth. They're not raindrops. We call them cloud droplets. We say droplet because that suffix let indicates it's kind of a small little guy, right? So a cloud droplet um, is what we're measuring here. There's the diameter. The units are in microns. Now, a micron is a millionth of a meter. It's a thousandth of a millimeter. And uh, for some of the flights, for example, on one of the flights, by the way, on this axis is the number of particles we found with each of these different droplet sizes. On one of the flights, we found rather large droplets, typically 20 to 25 microns. That was on a day when the air was rather clean, with very little dust and aerosol in it. On another day, when there was a lot of dust in the atmosphere to begin with, the cloud droplets were a lot smaller. The uh, reason for that is, of course, uh, the cloud droplets form on dust particles. So if you got the same amount of water to be condensed, if you put them on a lot of droplets, a lot of dust particles, they're going to be small. If you put them on a few dust particles, they're going to be larger. This, then, will be the situation that can lead to precipitation, because these larger droplets start to collide with each other and merging. And after that happens a few dozen times, you can build a raindrop, and it falls to Earth. Whereas you could not get this cloud to, precip to precipitate, because the uh, droplets are just too small uh, to hit each other, and they won't get that 
process going where they can form a raindrop. So that gives you a bit of an introduction to atmospheric research. I'll leave you with this. If you want to be an atmospheric scientist when you grow up, uh, these are some of the questions that you will be asking, and we are asking today about clouds in the atmosphere. How big are the, cl how big are the cloud droplets? Um, how many cloud droplets are there? Is the cloud raining? Why or why not? Um, are the cloud particles made of liquid water or are they ice? Uh, how, do the, how does the cloud reflect sunlight? And does that cause the Earth to be cooler than it would be without the clouds? That's a very important question in this day of, of climate change. What role are clouds playing in controlling the temperature of the Earth? Um, are the clouds cleaning the atmosphere by collecting dust particles and then raining them out? And finally, how will clouds change if the Earth becomes warmer, as we think it is uh, going to do? So I'll leave you there, and thanks for your attention.